Hello, welcome to this uh, Bordenoni masterclass sort of roundtable discussion with some of the musicians who regularly played at the Giornate. Um, my name's John Sweeney. Uh, I'd like to introduce my four other musicians. We've got about 45 minutes to discuss various questions about how you play the silent films. Um, and if you have any questions, if you want to put them up, um, ask them and we'll try and answer them as best we can. So introducing my uh, fellow accompanists here, first of all, Dr. Philip Carley. Hello. Uh, Dan van der Herk. Hi. Jose Maria Serralda Ruiz. Hello. And Mauro Columbus. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Here we all are. Uh, so the first question, which we've kind of discussed a little bit between ourselves, is how was it to record for the Giornate as opposed to playing live for it? What's the difference between making a recording and doing a live performance? Has anyone got any thoughts? Well, for me, always the problem with making a recording is that you th in instinctively think that it's going on for posterity and you can't change it once it's done, which is a real problem for me. I, I, I don't think any of us really like recording um, or find it, you know, lots of fun. Um, but on the other hand, for me, I just did it in one take as a performance. Whereas for commercial recording, I do multiple takes or you know changes in the performance, so um, it was difficult, but I managed to get it through my one film, my two films through that way. Uh, how did others do it? Oh, sorry. How did you find it? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, well, uh, it was it was a pretty much uh, uh, like. Um, you're right, uh, Philip. I mean, it, I mean, no one likes uh, to record, and especially I, I really hate to record the uh, improvisation, improvisational uh, segments and improv improvisation because basically I'm always uh, having this in mind. Oh, could have been just much better that way. Uh, the uh, this this project was uh, was uh, like in the middle of having a commission and uh, just playing right away. Uh, to the film because uh, I was able to prepare some research and to write down some stuff, but not as much and not as less. So that was, uh, in a sense, it was very challenging. I What I did was to prepare myself. Yusuf, uh, I really felt it was like a, like a, a concert performance. Uh, I mean, how I solved this was just playing and practicing just lots before recording. And that was probably the, the 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 most important difference because it was a, a short time. I mean, we we had a, a a short deadline, so I solved it that way. And it was uh, because um, it was very significant. I, went, I want to mention this: uh, uh, the the general manager of the Mexico City Philharmonic, someone I, I worked with uh, during the last six years, just day by day, uh, passed away because of COVID. You said the exact time I was preparing oh, this. So yeah, there was a, a kind of <laughs> outbursting like therapy in a sense. So that's like very significant for me in this uh, precise project. Mm. Um, Dan, you had a slightly different situation in that your films with the biograph were, were very right. short. Uh, um, yes, I, I um... My situation for the Genat was a little bit different because the music that was screened was the official music, official recording for the DCP of uh, the Biograph. So I had the luck to have the chance to have two days for recordings. And since this was a completely composed score, uh, there was no improvisation involved for me this time. Um, and I had two days to record, so it was so much more comfortable for me than when I hear uh, you guys speak, uh, because I could do, like Philip said, several takes and uh, pick the one that I like best. And I will even, even freely admit that at some points we took the first half of the first take and the second half of the second take and glued them together, as my sound engineer can so magically do. So, um, and that, that's quite different. I would probably feel exactly the same as you if it were 
uh, a more improvised score, I would feel less secure probably. And um, I, will, I would have tried to do it in a performance style like, like Jose and Philip uh, just told. That's that, that's interesting because I, I know I found it um, because my film was a feature film. Uh, I found this whole thing it, it's very different from actually composing a score. If you are improvising, and when you're recording, I ended up recording using MIDI, so I could edit very easily. Um, mm -hmm. But I was I always feel the danger of doing that of doing the the, the score in in bits is that you lose the sense which you always have, even mm -hmm. if things go wrong in a live performance. You have a sense of the structure of the film, of the timing of the film. And of course, you have the audience there, which gives a whole kind of different triangle, which is going around in terms of in terms of playing for a film. Um, I'll be, I haven't actually listened to what I've done since I recorded it. I'll be interested on Saturday to see what I think. Um, but I know in the past when I've recorded improvised scores, I have felt I've lost that sense of continuity and, and of transition and overall structure, which... I would have had if I was playing live. Um, I, I was going to say, John, you touched on something I was thinking of. Missing the audience is so is has been debilitating um, uh, because we feel, you know, uh, at least for me, I can sense the house behind me. Yeah, you know, we can all sense that there's so many hundreds of people behind us, and there is an electricity that transmits to what we do. So uh, when you're all alone in the studio, just playing, uh, you've got nobody but yourself in the picture. Yeah. And you don't have that added energy that boosts, boosts you along. Yeah. And you know you can't stop, of course, in the studio, which is not a, not an option when you're <laughs> playing live. Right. Now, 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 how did you you have a feature as well? How did you find recording for your feature? Um, well, so um, I initially decided, in spite of the time I had to prepare, to maintain the spirit of the festival. So, trying to to keep. Uh, a good compromise between, uh, let's say, composition and spontaneous composition improvisation. Um, also, this decision was due to the fact that I knew since the very beginning I had uh, to record in one take uh, because of technical issues. I couldn't record at home because my piano had some problems and there were no, let's say, I had to find only uh, a place and people just helped me to record uh, uh, volunteering, so I couldn't take uh, too much time to to record in one session. So I just um, knew since the very beginning that I shouldn't have worried too much about uh, preparing too much. I know that when we record, uh, we always listen to ourselves, and we are probably the worst judges or ourselves every, every time we could never be satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, should, should we go on to another question? There's a question which I think comes out of this, which is how do you create continuity and shape a film and, and what devices do we use to, to try and do that? Uh, it's me, see? It's me, see? <laughs> yeah, it could be you, yeah. Ah, you. okay, yes, ah, maybe, okay. Yes, maybe. <laughs> one, one, I think one important think thing, one important when, thing uh, when, uh, to keep, uh, to keep um, uh, the continuity the con of music in the film is to be able to, to, be able to uh, how to say, the transformation of, of the theme we use. So once you decide uh, or to, to use a certain music motif, to have the skills with the improvisation to modify in many times this this uh, musical idea so that it can be presented in more situations and uh, and also very different situation for instance uh, let's say the transformation between major and minor of the same idea could uh, change completely the meaning of the images uh, we see or it's required by the images by the way and uh, or other time, 
we can use the same idea with a slow tempo or with a fast tempo or with um, different dynamics. Uh, don't know, for instance, if I play something loud, uh, could be uh, related to something we see in this moment. But if I play softly or with other nuances, it could be just something we remember that comes from the past. So I think, and anyway, uh, a very uh, little cell, musical material, can be expanded in many times to give continuity to the music material inside the, the film we are accompanying. Uh, but, you know, for creating shape, uh, it's an interesting business because it's, for me, multi-textured. Um, because I look at how, you know, first thing is acquiring all the information. Um, and I think, uh, well, John and I talked about this before, is what the structure is, is what the film is in the context of the country, how long it is. Um, if it's complete, which actually cropped up in yesterday's uh, discussion concerning when lights are low, um, so you're you know you're looking at all these things and trying to create shapes with sequences and with uh, persons um, and with the scenery. You know we're playing everything to give shape to it. There's one thing I was going to say uh, that's kind of an interesting thing that we can do is in circumstances where there's a glaring error in film speed is that sometimes we can adjust the film speed musically. Um, I found that to be, uh, I've had to play films from the teens in the United States at venues which could only project at 24 and they're running films that should run at about 19, but then you start thinking in bigger forms, more enveloping structures. And uh, by that means you can actually slow the film down for the audience um, and give a better impression of the picture. But uh, yeah, putting it together and having, you know, if you can pull them off, um, as Mauro said, and I've heard Neil say, if you can come up with themes, light motifs, um, linking structures, and all of this has to be processed like that. We're going so fast. Um, it, it makes it, it, then you can give some unity to an improvisation. Anyone else with thoughts? Yes. Well, uh, what I usually do uh, when I, I mean, if I if I can watch the film uh, before, is that I, I can sometimes I, I try to do a a sketch, a kind of map uh, of where is it going, uh, just to divide the uh, development, just to you know, not not get surprised with the film. But if if I haven't watched the film, I usually draft uh, musical ideas pro probably late motifs you don't you never know what you're taking as late motif or not uh, because if you haven't seen the film you're already building up so yes exactly as, as philip addressed uh we are we are using the scenery we are using uh whatever we we have in hand and comes in handy but those are like the two basic uh strategies i use uh, if, I, if i can i can i can even even for shorts you can figure out i mean how many shorts are are about to be screened and then you you can figure out how to map your whole uh, your whole session, your whole screening, in a sense. So more or less, uh, that's how it works for me. Oh, one last yeah. thing. There was one last thing I was going to mention is editing. The editing of the film, for me, is really crucial in giving a rhythm um, for depending upon the country because it changes from American films to German films uh, to. Uh, Japanese films, um, Danish, so that you have to bear that in mind when you're constructing your own work uh, and be flexible enough to uh, try and be a good partner to that kind of pacing. Um, 
which means sometimes extending phrases, you know, thinking in different styles of phrasing. So anyway, that was just another thing. Yeah, so yeah in, terms, in terms of editing, it helps me a lot to, to follow the way the editor and the director have shaped the film themselves. So I try to follow uh, that because a well-made film has a shape of its own and mostly goes a little bit like that. Uh, so I try to follow that and that when you see, okay, this idea is closed, I close my musical idea so that I can start a new one. And for me, that really helps to, um, well, to also break the film down into, uh, let me say, eatable bits, if you understand what I say. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember hearing the, the great film composer, Elmer Bernstein, give a talk. And he talked about finding the heartbeat of the film. Right. And I think that's a, it's a really valuable concept. And, and I know when you're playing for a film you haven't seen, like we've very often had to do, if you find the heartbeat of the film, sometimes it's just luck and you sort of find it and then the whole film mm -hmm. sort of makes sense to you, even though you don't know what exactly is going to happen. You've kind of got the rhythm of it. Um, and other times you could spend the whole film struggling against the film. You haven't found the way in, but, but, but it's, it's a mysterious thing. It's something to do with timing. It's to do with the emotional landscape of the film. It's to do with a whole lot of things. Um, but I, I know when you do find it, you really know that you, you've, you've got somewhere and it suddenly everything becomes much easier and you feel free. And, it, and you know, when it's working at its best, you're not even aware of what you're playing. You're just in the film and it's just happening. I don't know. If, I'm sure we've all had that experience at some point, maybe not all the time, but it's certainly at some point. No, no, it's, it's true. We, uh, uh, when lights are low, I mean, I felt it was... Uh, <laughs> It was a good film, and I didn't feel like it. W I think we've all had play films where we felt like we were carrying them, um, you know, trying to do something with that felt like it was, you know, it, it's not even not getting the heartbeat. It's a film that is almost dead, and we're trying to, <laughs> get, you know. Uh, you know, bring it back to life a little bit or give it a little more zip. Um, but when you have a film that's well made, as Don said, you know, it it gives you so much uh, that it becomes, and I've never done it, uh, like surfing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're riding the wave. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember talking about talking about almost dead films. I remember something Neil used to say, which was that like sometimes you've got to play what the film should have been and not what the film <laughs> is if it's a if it's a really dire film. So if I may ask you, how how did you prepare for this one be, oh, before for, you made this recording? For, yeah, for the for yesterday's film. Well, uh, you know, I watched it uh, a couple of times. Um, it was a bit difficult because they never furnished me a translation for the Cro Croatian <laughs> titles. How was your Croatian? <laughs> I asked and asked and I didn't get it. So I had to go back to the trade journals and the synopses, trying to find the uh, you know the ones that were the most complete to make sure that what I was seeing and what I was deducing, because I'm afraid my Croatian probably isn't any better than any of yours yeah. uh, <laughs> it, it, and um, I haven't seen it yet I saw a little bit of it yesterday uh, just because titles are such an important part of the film everybody mm -hmm. you know, some people think that they're extraneous to the film but I think they're an integral part and sometimes there are arrival points in titles so I'm having to guess you know, which points these are. And um, one of the reasons I want to watch it is to see if I got it right. Because I, I had to prepare basically on either side. Um, the other thing was because Jay had said that he thought I could do it without um, oriental kitsch, mm. without too many cliches, you know, without, you know, making it cliched. And... Uh, that's something that you have to be very careful of 
with films that have a strong ethnic uh, setting. And you kind of inflect to give color, but then you pay attention to the drama more than the setting, as it were. Unless it's a film made in China and so forth, uh, as Gabrielle did, where it is a part of Chinese culture, and you have to kind of readjust your thinking as best you can within Western musical training, as we all have, to fit into that kind of milieu. And that was something else that John had pointed out about Gabrielle's accompaniment for his film. Um, so that's for me. That was my preparation, and then it was a it's a romantic melodrama with a big fight at the end, and um, and Cecil Hayakawa looking like Maurice Chevalier at points in a, a tuxedo with a straw skimmer. So anyway. <laughs> I, I think that's an important point you make there, and it has uh, been discussed already a little bit in uh, the discussions from me and also by uh, Jose, uh, when there is uh, very national uh, scenery, do you go with that musically, yes or no? And uh, for myself, I'm actually curious to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, for myself, there was kind of a struggle sometimes with the biograph films where there was no drama to go with because the scenery was all there was. And I always am afraid that when I try to... Some of these folk music themes, they are so uh, embedded in the culture of these countries that I feel like I'm only imitating. I almost feel like an imposter uh, trying to to copy that, and I'm always afraid that I might uh, offend someone accidentally uh, by by playing it wrong. Um, so I saved those bits for the last, and until the deadline really came, well, I had to come up with uh, with something. And I I'm curious about your thoughts. I remember one last thing I would like to say about that. I remember the Malta film. Uh, it was was a longer one. It was a beautiful shot of Malta from the sea. And I started to listen to Maltesian, is that the correct word? Maltesian uh, traditional music. And that uh, made it, it's wonderful music, but it's sung and it's accompanied by guitar doing boom, frang, boom, frang. And I even have a sort of adaptation for that for piano, but I threw it out. I thought this doesn't this work. This, uh, especially if other uh, people not being aware uh, what Maltesian music sounds like. This will just sound, yeah. Well, I was thinking, okay. uh, oh, <laughs> go ahead, John. Yeah, so no, just, I'm just going to button here because I've actually done that film as well because we did it as part of the Great Victorian program we did mm -hmm. in London. And I didn't go for anything Maltese at all because it is the, it's the Malta was the, the big British naval base in the middle of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And that's actually basically a film of the British naval might in the Mediterranean. So I went, I went for that. But I, I, you talk about feeling like an imposter. I, I, I could see in certain situations you have to be careful about about this whole issue. But in general, I feel we are imposters. That is sort of part of our job in any situation. <laughs> um, and you know, the filmmakers in general weren't after absolute authenticity. Though I have to say, Dan, your your Hungarian one, Bartok would have oh, been yeah, proud I, of I, you. Let's not think of ourselves as imposters. As much as anybody on the screen, we are actors. We are really, right. you know, we are, um, We it, I often think of what we do. That's why I always say film accompanist. Uh, you know, I feel, um, you know, I would never have, but I've accompanied singers and instrumentalists and so forth. I've done leader and opera and um, conducted operetta at least. Um, so that we, we're not, we're not really imposters. Uh, we're doing our best with parts and Sometimes, you know, the national, you know, the nationalistic view is being taken, as it were, 
these films are take uh, you know of various cultures are being taken from other standpoints. I mean, uh, there are other countries. Their view, for instance, of uh, you know China or uh, India or any other country, you have to look at it whether it's actually a film of the culture or if it's the countries uh, and the director who is making the film, their view of the culture. And that's more, more to the point. And we have to be sensitive to that. We, we won't offend anybody if we're, if, we're sen if we're just sensitive as we all are. And you're, you're so right, Philip. And uh, there, there's, there's some, an important factor here that's uh, that people, I mean, these films were filmed in a time where definitely, I mean, a different mindset was around people watching otherness. And, and that's something uh, that uh, Jennifer, I mean, that, that this uh, scholar that, that was uh, like commenting the films after the, our uh, opening show uh, addressed at, at her book. And I really thought, for instance, uh, this was a, an interest, interesting decision for me, for, for instance, in the Cairo film, this fashion film mm -hmm. I played for this time. Um, and I, it was felt, I, I began like, like shooting ideas around this Egyptian-like music, which is Egyptian, what's Egyptian-like, that's, that's really false. So uh, I rather like travel, time travel to what was a French reading of Egypt and I found something quite useful in, in Saint-Saëns, Egyptian concert. And uh, yes. what, what I did was like, I sat down with, with the score and find out what exactly were this Orientalism. I read a couple uh, articles related to Orientalism and French music. And uh, then I, I like tried to cherry pick <laughs> scales and, and uh, structures that were clearly Orientalistic by the time. So I, I dare to use that use beautiful uh, Egyptian uh, concert theme by Saint-Saëns, and that's it, because I'm not composing. And I mean, in the style of Saint-Saëns, please, I won't never, <laughs> ever <laughs> stop. Uh, uh, but I was trying to use the, the, the theme. Well, it's interesting. I, uh, my advisor uh, at Eastman in musicology, he wrote a whole book on exoticism in the 19th century and of the interest of, um, oops, sorry, uh, particularly, let me get this back in, which has, has uh, particularly the French uh, in other cultures. And of course, even within countries themselves, they had interest within other regions uh, of their own country. Um, like, you know, Gounod looking at Provence, which has a different culture. Um, Ippolitov Ivanov with his Caucasian sketches. Um, it, 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 it's a very, you know, it's a mixed question. And of course, the, uh, the Egypt concerto of Saint-Saëns, who wrote a great deal of, you know, ethnically colored music, going back to, I think, one of his first operas, which is called The Yellow Princess, Les, Les Princesses mm -hmm. Jean. Um, which is a Chinese fairy tale. So uh, I, I, we have to bear that in mind. Uh, the films are historical documents. We have to respect them. We try to do them in a way that won't offend people, but at least are true to the film. Um, at, at, I, but I'll leave that right there because there's more to talk about. Um, yeah. um there's a question which we've, um, someone who's watching has sent in about um, if we've seen some of the films we've played for or composed for in the past, how has that coloured how we've played for it now? Like, And it's quite close to our question of, like, if we know a film well, do we try and prepare or use material we've used in the past? Or we do, do we, when we play for it again, do we try and think it afresh? Mauro, do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, oh, okay. Um, I think, uh, um, assuming that um, the first time the, the music has been improvised, but 
assuming also that maybe I enjoyed playing the ideas that I use, I would use them probably more and more without locking the music, but uh, trying to, how to say, to play the same things till the moment I decide uh, or I feel they are a little bit uh, old and I'm not satisfied anymore. So if I think something works uh, and I enjoy playing it, uh, I try to use it more and more. So that's uh, probably my answer to this question. Do you have a feel, Mauro, um, when you try, I, th I think that might be something we all recognize, uh, when you try to recreate uh, the music that then uh, was created out of spontaneity, that it doesn't work anymore a second time? Mauro? Uh, it's, no, sometimes, uh, yes. Uh, there, uh, there, there are a million times where I think something works and then I realize it doesn't work. <laughs> So it's possible. <laughs> I think it's part of the the job. I don't th don't think it's a matter of um, getting more mature about a certain um, yes, uh, judging ourselves. But it's just part of the how to say the time you engage on a certain matter. Sometimes you feel okay, and especially at the beginning, you you feel more enthusiastic. Then a little bit at the time, settling adds uh, components in our minds, in our feelings that uh, get uh, us a little bit colder, a little bit, uh, how to say, a little bit um, more like someone else in some way. And so those moments uh, probably uh, make us uh, change the idea completely or just modify it. Yes, it's a... Uh, Many times happens that we um, we change our mind in terms of musical material. I was th for me. I uh, I always look at a ch uh, coming back to a film that I played before or many times. Um, I always try to do it differently. I I look at it uh, partially. It's out of respect for the film. I think I. I need to exercise all the, you know, all the strength I have as an accompanist to do the film justice, and I think it's a courtesy to the audience to do that because I don't. Want, I'm always afraid of being complacent, you know, falling into patterns, and I that's something I I dread. But also, it's a new chance. It's I, I I just thought of it is that you know every time we're presented with a film, it's another opportunity for us to create something new for ourselves with something that is fixed. Um, the film will not change except in our minds, perhaps, and um, that is that's a treat, that's a real gift. Uh, you're, it's not like. Uh, what would ki what kills a lot of Broadway and West End actors is going on stage and saying the same lines over and over and over and over again. Um, we can always come to a film and make it something different for ourselves, um, um, and, f and find different, find different elements, in it. elements in it. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's interesting what you say about the film doesn't change because I've often had the experience playing for comedies that the film has changed because audiences will just laugh in completely different places um, and it can be quite disconcerting. You you you've played for say a Buster Keaton film one night and another night you do it and a place where you've got a big laugh before people don't laugh and then they'll laugh somewhere else. It feels like the dynamic of the audience and I think this is also a a question which has come in from someone outside about they're interested in Philip's comment earlier about how the audience affects the film. I mean, we are very aware in comedy. We are very aware of the audience. It makes a huge oh, well, difference. Um, I have there's a, I have a specific example of a of a film where I played for one audience, and it's a film called The Missing Link with Sid Chaplin, oh, wonderful Sid Chaplin, and uh, directed by Chuck Reisner. And I played it at the Syracuse Cinefest. 500 people watching this film in dead silence. It's a comedy. And I felt, the phrase I've used is that I felt like I was swimming through lead. 
trying to get to the end. Um, and a year later, at another festival, which was an all-comedy festival, they proposed doing The Missing Link. And I went, no, for God's sake, please. And I know what this film is. And they said, what? It's rare. Well, okay, it's rare. There's a good reason. Um, and I, I, but they, they were insistent. And I said, okay, if you program it, because there were several accompanists, uh, it, was, it was me, Ben Medell, and Andrew Simpson. I said, I'd like to play it. I really want to play it for the audience. And the audience ate it up. They, they just went crazy for this thing. And I still think it's a stupid film, but <laughs> but it, it it is a different audience, and it and the film was different for them than it was for this show me audience in Syracuse. The audience in Syracuse needed to be shown that it was good. The audience in Washington D.C., where I played it the second time, was really expecting it to be good, and they wanted it to be good, and they were on the film side to begin with. So, yeah. That's very true, and, and, and I mean, even in, in non-comedies, you can really feel the audience's attention, and that you're in a you're in the whole experience together. Um, anyone else have any um, experiences along these lines? Yeah, uh, I was uh, I was thinking about precisely these uh, set of uh, very short set of uh, Mexican film, silent films. There are only four feature films. Uh, so I've been playing them like uh, during the last <laughs> twenty years time, church time, <laughs> and I, I have a trip with that. Uh, whenever I'm asked to to play that again and again and again and again, I usually try to uh, uh, call friends, call call my my people in my ensemble, or just revisit the the films in any possible way. Because as you said, Philip, you're so right. We are always tempted to 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 get into the formula, especially with films we we have played like plenty of times. And that's that's precisely one of the a, a kind of back, back sign, you know, you can use. Uh, you 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 must force yourself to revisit the film or revisit the material, and that's related precisely with audiences. Audiences are very useful to revisit. I mean, when you're revisiting a film, uh, they you're sensing the whole. That's true. You're sensing the audience, and it's so so amazing. For instance, uh, I I went through that same thing. Especially with uh, with the, this uh, film Tepeyac, which is a Mexican silent film, uh, recently uh, uh, issued in, in a DVD set, which is uh, quite nice. And the point was that um, it was so fun because whenever that film is presented to very young audiences, they're always laughing about uh, uh, you know special effects of of miracles and uh, the Virgin appearing, and uh, so. Uh, it's almost unbearable. You, you didn't have an idea, but I mean, when you're watching to this um, Virgin's Miracle in Tepejac, which is uh, that's how the how the the film develops, then you get to the this climatic moment, and ev everyone's laughing. That makes you immediately <laughs> readdress and re you know, you have this very romantic Italian life because that's 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 how Mexican music for films was like because we were very influenced by, by Italian divas. Uh, we, well, them, uh, those Mexicans. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> that's like, like the most amazing thing. I mean, you're, you're figuring that out. You're just tying to your, uh, let's say, historically, historically informed farce. <laughs> let's call it that way. <laughs> and you cannot stick to that. You have to revisit the film and rebuild it because the audiences were laughing okay let's let's see how can we do what can we do you're laughing i'm doing my italian drama so there should be a, a point in the middle and let's try to figure that out now <laughs> so that's that's a, an interesting goal and the audience is is, is a great tool yeah i must i must say in terms of playing the film on on a kind of when you can remember what you did last time, I find it very hard. Um, I wish I could forget, um, mm. because it, what's very hard is when you don't want to play what you did last time, but you can kind of remember it. Mm. And it's sort of like it's like trying to not think of a rabbit. If someone says, "Don't think of a rabbit," you know, <laughs> it's that sort of thing. You can't get away from from it's that's, that's very hard. And I, I I'm very happy when I. If I had to play a film again and I want to be away from what I did before, I, I always try and start it in a completely different way. So at least 
the path I'm setting off on for the film leads in a different direction from from where I did it before. Has anybody here done a matinee in an evening on the same picture? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the kind of thing. <laughs> that's a killer. Um, I've only done it, I think, once. I did it on The Lost World when we did our new restoration at the Eastman House. And that was just a, that was murder. It, because I've been through it once. I've had the dinosaurs and the destruction. Um, and, you know, I had 30 minutes between the showings. So uh, has anybody, you know, it's like John said, you, you, you know, don't think of the rabbit. Yeah. For me, it's don't think of the squirrel, which everybody can now empathize <laughs> with here. But uh, um, has anybody else been in that position? Yeah, I've, just... I've, I've had to play seven chances three times in two days. Oh, and I have God. to say, the third time I did it was one of the worst performances I've ever given. Um, the first and second went too bad. <laughs> but I just, by the third one, I, I just, I had no actual ideas. And I couldn't, even the ideas I'd had before, I couldn't even reproduce. It was just too much. But I, I guess, I mean, in the, in the silent era, of course, this is what people did all the time. I mean, I yeah. know they weren't necessarily improvising. Now, well, the organ was... a lot of the organists were, um, at least in this country, yeah. or at least they had sets of music up in front of them that they could, you know, create mo different mosaics yeah. from. But, uh, it... but, so there's a question which has come in from the audience, which is, uh, this is a very quick one. How long did you have to prepare your accompaniment from when you got the film and to actually recording it? I think the answer is not very long at all. Um, yeah. For all of us, it was basically about a week, I think, just over a week. Yeah. I had two days to do 11. <laughs> 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 but, but on the other hand, the music for the biograph was already recorded when I knew it was going to be screened yeah, here. Yeah, so yeah, that was yeah. Mauro, was that the same situation for you? You, only, you had a very short time to record. Is, it, is this just for this, this occasion? Yes, that's right, for the Trinati. Yeah, yeah I, was given, uh, I was given a couple of weeks. Basically, three, four, three weeks to prepare. Three weeks? Why? <laughs> it's a lot. That, that, it was too much. Lucky. I didn't have three they must weeks. like you better. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had two. I had two weeks, but a week of it was asking for a translation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're just about out of time, so I think there's, uh, this is, a, I think, quite a good last question. Uh, it's five minutes before you're playing for a film you've never seen and you know hardly anything about, apart from a few comments from an archivist who has seen the film at some point. What's going through your head and how do you prepare? <laughs> Be friends with the piano. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's... Oh, sorry, what? yeah. Oh yeah, what, what I do is I, I want to befriend the piano. Most of the time it's at a piano you don't know. So if I've only had five minutes, I want to know everything this piano can do so I, so I know that I can trust that. Um, because that piano for the next, I don't know, one and a half, two hours, is going to be your very best friend in the world. So I want to know, know its ins and out. And then when I trust the piano and I trust myself with it, then, it can just start and we'll see. Okay. I, for me, it's just going in within about a minute and a half, I can sense the editing and style of the picture. And then I start writing with it, uh, with what little knowledge I have. Um, and then I start looking around and processing, you know, it's the computer going, go, 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 go. So. Uh, oh, Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I will mostly do the same. I mean, you start to stick to a kind of a very static uh, development at the very beginning of the film. The, the very, I mean, I mean, five minutes. I'll use my mind and try to just calm down. That's the how I use those five minutes, <laughs> and then just stick to a very, a very uh, like static development at the, at the beginning of the film and then get into it and as, as yeah. Philip says, you just begin writing and developing <laughs> meanwhile. I mean, I, I think for me, I'd try and spend that five minutes thinking about any fragments of knowledge I've got from anyone about the film and also just thinking of something to start with, the titles. Um, mm -hmm. So that I start with something definite. So I'm not starting with something which is very kind of like 
I don't know what's going on here because I think that's never a good look um, or sound. I remember for anything. The first minute bef before the film starts, my hand goes like, no, no. And but I mean to start off with something definite and be completely prepared for it to be completely wrong and then be willing to change. Um, I mean, one thing which is hard is if you do know a little bit about the film, someone's told you something, it actually, when the film starts, you realize, you realize that it's actually not what you you got from that person, is not a, a good impression of it. And sometimes I've had, I know, I've had the situation where I've been wanting to play the film I've been told about and not wanting to change. I mean, it's, you have to go with what the film is. Um, yeah. Mauro? Well, yes, usually... Um, yeah, at least uh, I try to think of a, a music theme uh, to start with and then adapt to the film gradually, mm. possibly as soon as possible. But yes, also depending on which kind of film it is, I probably would know if I have to play for a documentary, Probably, it's probably easier to start uh, because sort of neutral music, let's call it in this way, with, uh, but if it's a feature film, also we would know if it's a drama, if it's a comedy. It's um, so basically, it's important for us to have some safety themes that we could use as opening when we don't know what's really the film about, and then gradually adapt to the film itself when we are watching it. Excellent. I think I think it's now time we have to finish. I think the book fair is on at four o'clock. Um, the film fair. Um, so, thank you, everyone, and I hope this has been useful to people watching. So we all say bye bye now. <laughs> bye bye. 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 <laughs>